Um, hello, everybody. Uh, happy Monday. Happy week five. I guess we're ready to start it. It was just so fun to hear that there's already an interspecies friendship forming here. Um, <laughs> it, 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 I, I, I hope the mics got that. Yes. That's wonderful. Uh, welcome to salon number three uh, for the Counter Force Labs new series, Eyes in the Sky. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge native peoples. Um, UCLA occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Tongva and Chumash peoples. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to Hunungvetam ancestors, Ahihirom elders, and Io Hinkem, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. Last Monday, uh, UCLA geography graduate and PhD candidate Kate Kavanaugh Talk to us about how drones provide vital insights in kelps importance in sustaining life in our region. Uh, she shared many of those insights and illuminated some of her latest research that involves combining satellite imagery with drone footage. And for those of you who missed the lecture, it's available on the UCLA DMA YouTube page. Um, so today, uh, I'm really, really pleased to be joined by Dr. Ursula Heiser and PhD candidate uh, Eleanor Diamond. Um, hi, Ursula, and hi, Ellie. Hi. If I may use Ellie. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to DMA. Um, Ursula uh, Heiser holds the Marcia Howard Term Chair in Literary Studies in the Department of English and the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. She's co-founder and current director of the Lab for Environmental Narrative Strategies, also known as LENS, L-E-N-S. Um, her research and teaching focus on the environmental humanities, contemporary environmental literature, arts and cultures in the Americas, Germany, Japan, Spain, and Vietnam, uh, literature and science, science fiction, and narrative theory. Her books include, among others, a sense of place and sense, and sense of planet, the environmental imagination of the global, published by uh, Oxford University Press in 2008, uh, imagining extinction, the cultural meanings of endangered species, uh, published in 2016 by the University of Chicago Press, which won the 2017 Book Prize of the British Society for Literature and Science. She's co-editor of the Rutledge Companion to the Environmental Humanities and co-editor of the series Natures, Cultures, and the Environment with Paul Grave. She also is the producer and writer of Urban Arc Los Angeles, which is one of the projects we're gonna, we're gonna discuss today. A documentary created as a collaboration of Lens with the public television station KCET Link. Her more recent book uh, is a co-edited essay collection on environment and narrative in Vietnam, will, and it will be published in 2023. And she's currently at work, so it's very busy. Uh, <laughs> she's currently at work on a book entitled Reclaiming Ecotopia, Science Fiction and Environmental Futures. Uh, Ellie uh, Diamant, Eleanor Diamant, is a PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology at the UCLA Yale Lab and associate director of the Counterforce Lab. She studies how birds, specifically yuncos, in Los Angeles adapt and shift in urban areas. Beyond urban yuncos, she has explored the evolution of variation in male-like color traits in female hummingbirds, nesting behavior in cavity nesting birds, and population response to multiple stressor interactions. She uses techniques from evolution and behavioral ecology to parse apart what drives birds to act and look like they do. Fostering interspecies friendships with birds drives her day-to-day -day work, uh, which she hopes can help envision a shared future between humans and non-humans in an age of rapid global urbanization. So Ursula Eli, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us today to explore how uh, interspecies friendship can help foster the creation uh, of you know, urban environments which serve both humans 
and our non-humans counterparts, and I should perhaps add our more than human counterparts. Um, I would like uh, to uh, start uh, this uh, salon um, by saying how thrilled I was when we were preparing um, our conversation, just to hear you speak so spontaneously and, and share uh, this beautiful conversation. I hope we can mm -hmm. create that again today. Um, and I would also like to start with a personal anecdote. Um, if I may, very briefly, um, I hold very dear memories of going to a campsite in the southwest of France uh, every summer. Back then, I would live in Brussels, in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, it's a very dense metropolitan area. Um, and um, I still remember going back to this campsite, camping by the ocean. Uh, and, and this return has always been very uh, deeply soothing to me. Um, there was this something about being amongst other earthlings again, uh, waking up to their song. Um, there was something about slowing down to pay attention and, and just witness the extraordinary life that goes on in those trees. And I will always remember this feeling of just taking this deep breath and feeling, oh, I, I feel human again. Uh, that said, I'm, a, I'm an amateur birder. Uh, and I'd like to you know, this is my first question to you both. Um, how do you befriend a bird? We have um, Charlie here, uh, <laughs> but how, how, how does that work? I, will they come back to see me? How can I enter or foster a reciprocal relationship with, with a bird? How do well, so Charlie is a Jardine's parrot, so he's a pet bird. Can, can you and he was, oops, and he was, um, so Charlie is a Jardine's parrot, and he's a, he's a pet bird, um, so he was uh, raised by some, but by a human. And so um, pet birds, um, especially, but not only parrots, very easily form relationships with humans. And there are relationships that are, that are like friendships or, or family. I mean, they're, they're very affectionate. They, We'll have preferences, so we, I have other birds, and one of, one of our parrots prefers my partner very clearly and completely ignores me um, when my partner is in the room. Um, so they're very also specific about whom they prefer to be with in the, in the family. Um, so with pet birds, I don't think this is, um, this is at all a problem, among other things, because these are domestically bred and, and are um, hand-fed by humans, typically which then makes them look at humans as just members of the flock. I think with wild birds, it's a lot more complicated. I think that can happen. I remember um, when I lived in the Bay Area, I had a tiny backyard and um, there was a scrub jay who got so used to me that, that he came to actually feed from my hand. Not only that, but he would come when he just saw my car pulling into the street. I had a, uh, this was a sort of residential street and he would uh, immediately when he saw my little red car pulling and he would come and hang around the house and, and ask to be fed. So, so that can happen, um, and there can be a certain amount of reciprocity. I'm also thinking about the experiments that the composer and musician David Rothenberg did um, a couple of decades ago when, where he went um, with his saxophone around the world and would just play out in the wild, and wild birds would come and sort of perform with him and were clearly interested in his musical performance. Um, so there are these kinds of relationships, but I think you also have to be a little bit careful and ask, why do you want to befriend wild birds and what good does it do for them and might it actually be bad for them to be so habituated to humans that they then are trusting with humans that might one that, that do them harm, right? Or that would attract them to areas where they're likely to fly into windows or to be hit by cars or something like that. So I think, you know, we have to be careful about asking whether this is just something that we find cool. And it is very cool, obviously, but it's also, is it good for them? And is it, is it what, what do they get out of it? Um, and I think another ex ex interesting example, and then I'll turn it over to Ellie, is, is uh, falconers. I mean, who, who develop very close relationships with raptors. Um, and that's something that's a little more alien to me, but uh, I don't know how many of you have read H's for Hawk, um, book that came out, um, oh, I don't know, about eight or nine years ago, that um, really detailed the, the very emotional, very personal relationship between 
a British woman and um, the goshawk that, that she tamed. Um, so falconers have uh, tamed birds that you wouldn't usually consider pet birds for, for thousands of years, so. Yeah, I think about this, um, I work with wild birds um, and I've never had a pet bird, so my relationship with wild birds probably um, goes to the, I guess, the missing part. So when I think about how I befriend a bird, I view it also similarly to how I befriend a, a human, um, which is reciprocal and trying to understand what they need or what they want or how they're envisioning the world. So going to your point of what do, we, what do I want out of this? So I'm not, I'm not gonna attract a bird to come feed from my house or something like that if it's not something that that bird might need. Um, so in the wild, what this looks like, so I catch a lot of birds. We miss net birds, we follow their behaviors around campus, um, or I might be bird watching. But you let them go again, right? It's yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, absolutely, yes. And it's all permitted and all that. Um, <laughs> all about board, bird catching. But part of that is thinking about um, their own biology and how their behaviors develop, how they respond to different cues. So there might be some things that amongst humans might be uh, friendly behavior but to a bird might be viewed as a threat. So an example of that would be looking into a bird's eye. So wild birds, small birds might view that as a predatory act, whereas with humans, it might be something more familial in building connections. So it's a lot of delving into, I guess, the unknown and trying to understand the world as best you can from their perspective, to me at least, and going from there. So they might come back and see you. <laughs> Thank you for raising my concerns. <laughs> for me, what's super interesting to think about is also how, you know, when you are either with a pet bird or a wild bird, but their, their sensory apparatus is different, right? Like their eyes are completely different from ours. They see into part of the UV spectrum. So, so they see the same things that we're looking at, but they see them differently, right? And, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know as much about how they are, um, how they are hearing is different, but it's clearly very finely tuned. That's obvious, um, and so they might also experience the exact same situations, just, mm -hmm. just sensorily in a totally different way, right? Yeah, yeah, they'll experience something sensorily different, and maybe what they prioritize. So, what what is it with the juncos? What, what do they see in here? I'm curious. <laughs> um, so we haven't. Well, so I'm assuming they they see in the UV there. They're visual birds. They're not like I would call them the most visual of birds. So um, they, amongst themselves, uh, they pay attention to some markings for sure. So they have like white and black patches and some of their heads are darker than others. So they, are, they care about those kinds of, of things. Um, amongst, I think in the urban environment, they seem to care moderately for seeing a presence. Right. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, and they're, they care about song, so they're attracted to a certain kind of trill, um, which might vary between populations. But we've also noticed that, in, at least in LA, they seem to do a whole different kind of spectrum of song. Um, so they like will imitate other birds very often. We hear them imitate finches, which is pretty cool. Um, but some populations will have different kinds of songs than others, um, and some of that relates to human environments, and sometimes it doesn't. So it's, yeah. It's interesting, there's cultural evolution also in the birds. Wonderful, and you anticipated one of the questions I had for you later on, um, which was how, or what exactly, what, what do birds see? How do they see the world? How do they, so you mentioned Ursula, that they see in the UV spectrum. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I always wonder, like with the pigeon flocks, you mm -hmm. know, the pigeons are always very confident about knowing who's male and who's female, whereas if I look at them, I can't tell the difference. They don't have, and there are a lot of bird species like that that are where, um, where the males and the females are, are not, to us at least, visibly different. I mean, the juncos, the, the, yeah. the females have slightly lighter colored heads, no, that's a right? That's question. That's something that I wonder, too, and I know there are other birders here, so I'm curious what you all think, too, but um, there are some birds that are visually different to us. Um, there are some birds that are that vary amongst themselves across mm -hmm. yeah. um, that kind of sex spectrum. So I mentioned the hummingbirds, and there is something very interesting with one of those species um, that's been well studied by a colleague of mine, Jay Falk. So there are birds that look like males and birds that are females that look like the male of that species, 
and some females that don't, and then there are some that have this intermediate phenotype. And he's done studies trying to see how the males um, interact with those different kinds of females. Yeah, is it like drag or is it like trans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting thing that comes up. So the, um, the trait historically was labeled as transsexual phenotype, uh, which is not um, something that we use anymore because that is a human related construct that relates to gender. So this is what we call like andromorph. Mm -hmm. So there are females yeah. that have an andromorphic trait. Um, so male-like uh, trait. Um, so the females, they, at least in this one species, the white-necked Jacobins, um, they develop these features, so, and birds, so they molt, so they'll replace their feathers every year. And there are some cases where the females will look uh, male-like maybe when they're younger and then um, have more female-like plumage when they're older and some that stay that way the whole time. So there is, there is variation in some that stay in quotes female-like, so not like the male throughout their life. I mean, one of the most um, striking examples of that I remember of, of seeing a little bit how birds see was one time I took um, a little uh, bajeriger, like a little Australian parakeet, um, to a vet, and they have these little cheek patches that are differently colored than the, than the rest of their feathers. And he held the, the, the budgie under a UV lamp, and those cheek patches just exploded in color. He says, okay, that's what they see, and they think that's really sexy. Um, and I was like, okay, to me, this was just a little white cheek patch, you know, with that particular <laughs> color morph. Um, uh, and it was not uh, to the human eye at all, um, you know, distinctive. But yeah. then when you saw it under the UV, it was, whoa, this is, looks totally different than the rest of the feathers. And I've never done that with a pigeon, but I bet you, anything since they have these these iridescent feathers around their necks, right? Mm -hmm. I bet you anything you hold that under a UV light, um, it probably would look quite different. Yeah, um, it could also be, I mean, so I found a study a few years ago um, that found pheromones too, and this was specific to juncos, which is interesting because birds are often viewed as these visual creatures, um, but it could also it could be pheromones, yeah, and that, that sort of surprised me because in the early days in the 90s when I started having pet birds and got interested in bird watching, the general wisdom was that yes, they have a sense of smell, but it's not great and it's not nearly as good as like a dog's or a cat's, yeah. right? Um, but lately I've been reading other things about that, that actually smell is quite important to mm -hmm. them, so the knowledge seems to be evolving on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it speaks to the, the bigger thing is that there is a lot of unknown more yeah. than there is known, which I guess goes to the befriending. How do you befriend something that you don't know all that much about and how do you approach that with a degree of humility? Yeah, with the pet birds also there's huge discussions always about what to feed them um, with different species. And the truth is when you then try to go back and find scientific basis, like what do Jardine's parrots in the wild really eat, you know, when they don't eat crisp bread and cashews? Um, you know, the, it's actually very tough to know because a lot of these, these bird populations in like Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, you know, in Asia and Indonesia and such, it's, it's just very hard to watch what they eat on a day-to-day -day basis. You'd have to follow them around and it's not an easy thing to do. So, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns. I really love where this conversation is going. I have a really, very linear, you know, like a set of questions, but I, 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 I really enjoy the, the, the way you're, like we're going way beyond all the, the you know, binaries and we're looking at the, the way birds see and it, it's, it's just absolutely fascinating. So let me perhaps um, maybe uh, talk about um, something that's really um, a, a real commonality in your work um, which is, it seems to me at least that you're responding to, um, you know, the urgency of the current ecological situation and stressors that large cities like Los Angeles exert on wildlife. Um, so it's a little more serious here, maybe. Uh, I was wondering if um, birds, um, I mean, how do they experience that? How do they, like, go through those ecological changes? Is it something we can measure? Is it something we can see? Is it... Yeah, right? that's a really... Um, so, it depends on the bird, fundamentally, and it depends on the population, I would say. So we do measure a lot of things that birds 
are responding to and how they respond. So you can think about global change. It's multifaceted. So we have urbanization, so that's a change in the habitat by having a built environment. That change is not just the built environment, so there's human disturbance, the human presence on the landscape, uh, pollution, noise, light, all of these different stressors that are occurring at once. And then that is a small, it's not a small subset, but part of a larger reality of global change, which includes uh, different kinds of landscape change, if it's agricultural or resource um, extraction, global climate change, pollution, um, there, there, are, there is a whole consortium of shifts that we are doing. And so people are looking at that question from different lenses, different um, approaches. Uh, I look at it at a population level. So how do birds respond specifically to urbanization? Um, and it really just depends on, on how you frame your question. So if you're interested in understanding how they're responding to noise pollution, um, what matters in their biology that relates to noise pollution, it's song, because birds use song to communicate amongst themselves, uh, find mates, uh, talk to their flock mates, that, that sort of thing, so you can measure their song, uh, their song traits and how that relates to urban noise. Um, other things that we can do if you're interested in how their foraging shifts, it can be behavioral. Um, there are birds that are adapting to urbanization. Most birds, it seems, um, it's a major threat to their existence. But, you know, one of the things that is an unknown, I think we were talking earlier, there are a number of birds that historically have not been viewed as adapting to or adaptable to these landscapes, but now we see them slowly adjusting, which is very interesting. Um, but then we might be shaping their, their evolutionary trajectories nonetheless. Does that, does that help answer the question? Absolutely, and um, which yeah. ties in your, your work as well, Ursula, right, with the red crowned parrot. Yeah, so the red crowned parrots, um, you know, I got interested and I had two of them as, as pet birds, adopted pet birds um, from other people who didn't want them anymore. And then when um, uh, 11 years ago I moved down here to Los Angeles, I got really interested in uh, learning that there was a, a wild population of them living in the um, San Gabriel Valley and, um, and um, uh, you know, and um, Pasadena. And so, uh, so I went out to watch them, and there were flocks of hundreds of them. And their story is really a super interesting one, and so that's why we made that little 10-minute documentary about them. So they're a bird species that originally, um, uh, the original habitat was in northeastern Mexico, in Leon, Tamaulipas, and so, for, so forth. And, um, and they're endangered now in Mexico, on one hand because of habitat loss, which is a common cause of um, species loss and bioabundance uh, loss, um, and also because of the pet trade. So they were poached and exported to the U.S. by the tens of thousands between the late 60s and into the 80s, and then in the 1990s this was outlawed, which doesn't mean that it doesn't happen anymore at all. I'm sure it does, but it got a lot harder. Um, and. Um, and so they were exported to California and to Florida, and in both places, um, the populations escaped. We don't really know how um, or exactly under what circumstances, but wild-caught parrots are actually, and wild-caught birds in general, make absolutely lousy pets. I mean, they're not used to humans. They will be hostile, they will be aggressive, they will not want to be in your living room. There's nothing that behaviorally or evolutionarily <laughs> prepares them for that, right? But people didn't realize that. So part of the reason that there's so many out there is that people realized, ooh, this is actually kind of a nasty roommate. And you know how people are. They will just open the window and say, okay, bird disappears. Or it's possible that some of them, a group of them escaped at some point due to some kind of accident in the transit, we don't know. But we now have substantial populations of them in Texas where they might have migrated across the border by themselves, nobody knows. But in Florida and California, they're for sure um, uh, de the descendants of imported populations. And so we now have the weird situation where on one hand, this is an introduced species, which biologists and ecologists typically feel a bit ambivalent about, because even if they're not predators, you know, they do take habitat away in some cases and food away from native species. That seems to be a minor problem in this case, since they live mostly off of trees that we have introduced, like pecan trees, avocado trees, and so forth. 
And um, we, we're now in the uh, interesting situation where we have an introduced species that's also an endangered species and that seems to be thriving in Southern California and in Florida somewhat more than in its original habitat. Although in Mexico too, they have apparently migrated to some cities and are adapting to urban habitats that are not the original forests that they lived in. Um, so I just thought this was a super interesting case of a species where we don't quite know how to feel about them. They're both endangered and uh, introduced. So um, what do we make of that? And then um, our colleague, um, Brad Schaefer, in the um, biology department here, when we interviewed him about similar animals in his area of research, which is herpetology, um, he said, well, you know, there's two ways of looking at cities. I mean, one is the one that you mentioned. I mean, their cities are, for most wild animals, are enormously dangerous habitats. But it is also true that through these habitats that we, that humans design for other humans to live in, we unintentionally, and okay, sometimes intentionally, create habitat for other, for other species. Um, and um, so he was suggesting that in terms of turtles, I mean, if you go to the UCLA Botanical Garden, there's all of these red-eared sliders, which is a species that exists all around the world. It's everywhere descend, almost everywhere descended from, from escaped pet turtles. And you see them in here, in New York, in Tokyo, in Germany. They're everywhere. Um, and they've tried to reintroduce western pond turtles here, which is our native species um, and is endangered also. Um, and um, they haven't fared well in the urban environment. So his idea was, well, uh, what about if we try with another turtle species um, that is endangered along the eastern seaboard, but that might actually find a habitat here? And it's easier to try something like that with turtles than with birds, because birds, once you introduce them, it's hard to control where they go and what happens to them. With turtles, you could do a controlled experiment. But so his idea was, his was the urban arc phrase that became the title of the documentary, because his idea was like, well, cities, you know, um, cities do not offer a lot of the ecological niches that wild habitats do. But they do offer other kinds of niches, and we could conceivably think of those as opportunities for conservation. So what happened unintentionally in the case of the red-crowned parrots, nobody planned that or managed it, we could conceivably do intentionally. So one example besides the turtles that he brought up was um, we don't have any geckos, native geckos in Southern California, but it was excellent gecko habitat. So would it be conceivable to do, again, do a controlled experiment where we introduce endangered geckos from, say, Madagascar um, into an urban habitat here and see if this might function as a sanctu sanctuary as it has for the red crowned parents? Now, it would have to be controlled. And um, <clears throat> I mean, one reaction was to the movie was um, somebody said, well, if Ursula and Brad want to introduce species and then they become invasive, at least we'll know who to sue. Um, and that is, of course, a danger that you have to keep in mind. I mean, some species can become genuine dangers for the species who are already there. So you would, birds would not be where I would start <laughs> necessarily. Um, so, but you could do it with, with herps, you know, because it's just a little bit easier to control. So the idea is, are there actually possibilities for conservation in cities? And um, and so, you know, and that could take the shape of, of introducing species who are comfortable with, construct, with, with structures. Oh, and another example, actually, is the um, Mexican free-tailed bat that are now nesting in the tens of thousands under a bridge in Austin and have become actually a tourist attraction. So our structures sometimes do double duty as habitat for for um, other species. So we could think about that and we could also think about becoming just more intentional about what we build and how we might make it more, more hospitable for other species. Because I mean, a lot of our beautiful modern architecture, and that is the type of architecture that I prefer, but it's not great for other species because we have huge window fronts that are great for us but extremely dangerous for birds unless they're um, covered by some, some kind of foil or whatever. And there are now ecologists like John Morslov and Timothy Beatley who really think about those kinds of questions and try to suggest types of architecture and landscape architecture that can specifically not pose dangers for birds. I mean, on the East Coast in particular, but also here, there's just 
you know, millions of birds that die every year by crashing into windows that they can't see. It's a very, and it's not just your tall, your tall uh, office buildings. It's also just our regular residences, you know. And so, so there's a lot we could do to make it better habitat. Um, yeah, and then additionally to that, there's all the space between buildings. So I think Eric Wood at um, Cal State LA has been at the forefront of a lot of interesting research that if you just shift what trees you use for street yeah. trees, both increasing street trees, but also shifting them to native species, I think specifically like coastal live oaks, you can potentially increase habitat for um, native birds that otherwise might have lived in the city to, if it were not for the built environment, or increasing pocket parks across the city, things like that. Um, that might not take a lot of space, but it's just rethinking who our city is built for and increasing who we build it for as well, or who we design it for. Right, yeah. Well, I was projecting those I, um, uh, images here. Um, and Ellie, you, so that's the record. I also have a, I, I have a slide that, you know, among the ones that I sent to you off the Austin Bridge and the Mexican free tailed bats. Oh, that's another super interesting example. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, you can, you can, you can easily switch. look it okay. up online. It's a, it's a um, really famous example of a human structure that's become habitat for, for tens of thousands of bats every year, and it's a real spectacle to see them come in. Here, I think we okay. have this video, junko. the junko. Oh, here's the junko, yeah. Yeah, these juncos are, um, I forgot the building name, they're just that way, uh, yeah. And we have the, we have the um, cliff swallows that will come in a couple of months, so in April, um, cliff swallows come, and I mean, if you walk past Kaufman Hall, you'll see that in the arches of those uh, of the building, mm -hmm. there are these um, gourd-shaped clay nests. And every spring around April or early May, I always take my classes there to check this out because it's hard to notice when you don't know it's there. And then once once you've noticed it, it's it's hard to not ever notice it again when you go past there because there's lots and lots of these cliff swallows that return every year to these same clay-shaped um, nests that are, or, or gourd-shaped clay nests that are perfectly integrated with the Kaufman Hall architecture. I mean, that's kind of what I love about it is how they take advantage of the, of what's, you know, uh, just ornamentation, really. They're these little, little brick arches, right? But they use that as an anchoring for, for the clay nests that they build. So I always love these examples. Yeah. Or um, in the documentary also, we filmed a pigeon that had cleverly, like, built a little nest out of twigs behind a behind an electric pole um, and um, I mean it's it's just it's just incredible you know when you see these ospreys perching on I mean what, what would pigeons do if we didn't have power lines these yeah these days, well, right? I mean they use interesting because I guess going back to the question of how do birds see you're looking at a bird that is interpreting this built environment in a way that kind of in a way matches what they would have yeah. otherwise expected in their non-human built environment. So a pigeon that nests in cliffs, I saw like, I saw native, native non-urban pigeons nesting in cliffs one time, which right. was like mind boggling, but then they'll, they'll view a skyscraper or these awnings as these similar crevices, kind of like those cliff swallows with Kaufman. But why Hall. do they always sit on uh, power lines at the busiest intersections? That I can never <laughs> understand, because in terms of noise pollution, fume pollution, you know, they're the worst places and yet they mm -hmm. love it. You know, I mean, yeah. there's one major intersection between Sepulveda and Venice where there's always like 150 pigeons hanging out at that precise intersection when they could hang out over the gardens, you know, just a little ways <laughs> up, you know. So I'm sometimes, I, I find it really amusing, or sparrows that nest in the in these um, hollow pipes that sustain traffic lights. You know, it's like, really? This is like your preferred spot here? You know, when we have beautiful trees around campus and such, but this little metal tube is uh, what you like. So it is really interesting to, yeah. to watch that and to see how they totally reinterpret what's there and how they also then sometimes prefer things that you would not think had any analog in there. Yeah. So this Original is a nest habitat. that matches your description. Oh, yeah, okay, this is <laughs> great, yeah. So we look at junko nesting behavior <laughs> in urban um, environments, and this work was primarily done by Sam Bressler, just to give him a shout out. Uh, he was a master's student here. So we track the junkos nesting, and they're considered ground nesters, meaning that in their non-urban environments, they're described as 
uh, nesting on the ground, sometimes in crevices by riverbanks, uh, typically under bunch grasses. Uh, so that's their preferred habitat. This is a nest that was in a trench uh, next to um, Kaplan Hall, I think, underneath um, a cardboard box that was thrown, like just thrown in the in the gutter. So, oh, you're kidding! When was and that? And it was successful a few years ago. Now, oh, wow. now this this pair they have nested nonstop um, in a drain. Uh, <laughs> like they go through the grate. There's like a little space that's just bird size enough, and it's below the grate. And they've been very successful every single season. It doesn't rain a lot, <laughs> um, but they've been, yeah, they've been very successful. So it goes to what you're saying, how do they decide where to nest? And it's, it's kind of mind boggling, um, some of the preferences they make, but you might also think about predator threats, for instance, right. not in this example, this was honestly a very surprising choice that they've made, but like the great example or the tube example, if they're deep enough and their main predator is a crow or um, a hawk or a cat, things like that, that the, the predators that we have in urban areas might be slightly different, um, or the human disturbance might create patterns on the landscape that they might want to avoid, um, then they might be choosing these different kinds of habitats. Yeah, and it also, I mean, the other thing that, that I would add is that, you know, how we take, how we groom our gardens and our streets also matters. I mean, a lot of people have way too much of an obsession with very tidy gardens, which are actually not great habitats. So um, right outside the house where I live in, in Venice, there's one of those non-native palm trees um, on the, the little strip of green that's between the sidewalk and the street. And so um, the first couple of years that um, I lived there, you know, we had a gardener come through like once a year and cut off the dried fronds. And then one year I realized that um, actually or Orioles had built a nest in those, you know, uh, quote unquote, ugly looking, you know, uh, dry fronds that were hanging down. And so I've never cut them again. They've not come back, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but um, but um, also out in the desert with the Washingtonia palm trees, you see that finches go in and out and they have nests under those, those tree fronds. So. Um, our obsession with having everything look really clean and neat, sort of a la Dwell magazine, is maybe actually not the best idea. And like leaving some dry leaves in your garden so that, you know, um, lizards can, can hide under them and so forth is actually, and so that insects and, and larvae can attract birds there um, is actually not a bad idea. Another thing that I, that I found that surprised me was, um, so I, I have some compost bins in my little yard and when you open them, there's like these clouds of fruit flies that come up. And um, there's now a black Phoebe in the backyard that seems to always wait for me to open those. Um, <laughs> Those, those compost bins, so you can actually create sort of food for insect eating birds as well as, you know, the bird feeders that a lot of us um, put out. So there's, there's all kinds of ways in which you can improve the habitat, but I think, yeah, we also need to keep in mind that, yeah, basic things like window fronts, cars, are just not great for, for wildlife. I mean, the number of run over skunks and raccoons and, and um, possums and, and, and squirrels you see is kind of heartbreaking around LA. Yeah. Also a big one is just outdoor cats. Oh yes, yeah. yes. Um, that's the, that's the other thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, circling back to, to this idea that cities fractured natural habitats and yet create a new habitat, although a different one, um, I wonder how that makes us reconsider ideas around conservation. This is w one of the main or central questions in urban art, the documentary. I, w I wonder if you could perhaps grapple with that a little bit. Oh, me? I, 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 <laughs> either way, I mean, um, yeah, I've become a little um, interested in, in how in, in people like Timothy Beatley, who um, has written several books about this, but he's, um, I think one of his most recent ones is The Bird-Friendly City, where he gives various examples of buildings that have deliberately incorporated protection against window crashes. Um, then in Britain and in Germany, there are also companies, and this is like really, um, the German company in particular is amazing. So they make bricks that are regular construction size bricks, but with cavities already pre-drilled into them um, that you can make part of just regular house construction. So while you're building a house for people, 
you can also provide habitat for birds. And the German company in particular, so they have all of these different breeds. So there's some for martins, and there's some for owls, and there's some for, I mean, it's, it's hugely specific. You know, the openings are like at different sizes, and the cavities are different sizes. It's kind of hilarious, but it's also, I think, a really great idea, um, you know, where you can actually sort of hardwire habitat for other species, in this case, birds, into what we do in our construction. The one thing that I will say, though, is also that, um, you know, this is where sort of uh, our work on North Campus in environmental humanities comes in in a pretty important way because not everybody would be happy to have swallows nesting and shitting on their lawn, right? I don't care. I like it. I think it's part of natural processes. A lot of people are grossed out by that. So um, that's where sort of engaging with communities and figuring out what different urban human communities, what they like, what they don't like, what they know, what they don't know, what they're indifferent about, um, is super important if you consider introducing any kind of species into an urban habitat. Um, and I mean, I remember having those discussions a few years ago with people who were thinking about the ongoing revitalization of the LA River, where some conservationists, you know, want to take that as an opportunity along certain stretches of the river to reintroduce native turtles and frogs and snakes. And I'm sort of thinking, well, you know, turtles and frogs are probably okay and people will love them. Snakes will just be exposed to being killed because a lot of people do not like snakes and it doesn't matter whether they're venomous or not. Um, they just don't want snakes around where, they're killed, where their children play. So you can't just ignore that or you can't just say, oh, we have to re-educate everybody. That's a very hard thing to do. So you also want to think carefully again, what are you exposing the non-humans to by introducing them into those habitats? So I think we can do a lot to improve what we currently have, but I also, yeah, there are certain bird yeah. species that will never feel comfortable in a city, you know, and there's other species that might feel comfortable, but that, you know, like snakes, but that might just be exposed to being injured or killed in that environment. So I think we have to, we have to be really thoughtful about it. And again, you know, sort of look at, um, I'm looking at cultural perceptions of these, of these animals and looking not just at the science, which is super important, I mean, I think mm -hmm. the science that you guys do is super, super important, but also about, you know, so how does that dovetail or not? How does it clash with cultural perceptions of how a certain species should integrate or not into their own communities? Yeah, and I think it's also very interesting in the longer term as we're hopefully making our cities more habitable by other animals, how those community dynamics amongst the animals might unfold, because if we bring them in, which we should, of course, um, and they are coming in regardless. Uh, the dynamics that they have between each other and their resources is very different in an urban context, which might lead to different kinds of trajectories in the population itself, which is something that's very challenging to predict as yes. well. Yeah. Yeah, this is sort of um, where I'm interested in, in multi species justice, so which on one hand is concerned with, um, you know, how do we make decisions between. Um, you know, providing habitat or benefits for um, poor human communities versus providing habitat for, um, for other species. Like I live not too far from the Bayona wetlands and there are numerous and controversial and contested proposals for how the Bayona wetlands might be rehabilitated. Um, nobody's talking about, oh, let's just build housing for the unhoused people who also use the Bayona wetlands right now. It's a sort of, you know, unfor informal campground. Nobody's talking about that, and I don't necessarily want to talk about this. I don't want to convert the Bayona wetlands into housing, but why actually, why not? I mean, I think that's the kind of question that multi-species justice encourages us to ask. I mean, why, how do we weigh benefits to humans against benefits for non-humans? And then the other question is exactly the one that you just alluded to, which is how do we, intentionally or unintentionally choose between different species. I mean, in LA, as you all know, for a long time there was this real conflict over, over cats, um, feral cats in particular, but then also outdoor cats, which do major damage to songbirds. And when was it, a year, year and a half ago? The LA City Council made a decision in favor of cats. 
we have a no-kill policy for cats, but which does entail that we do not have a no-kill policy for song songbirds, which will continue to be eliminated, and also other things like lizards and so forth. Um, so, so that's kind of, and, and it's not easy to decide that because I also, um, I mean, I'm naturally sort of more drawn toward the birds and drawn toward taking the side of the birds, but I also totally see the argument of animal rights activists and cat activists in particular who say, well, wait a minute, we brought the cats here. This was us, and it's irresponsible people who let them out and let them go feral and let them breed in large populations. So. What, now we come around and we inflict the death penalty on them for that? Which is why a lot of them, you know, advocate for spay, neuter, and release. You know, just make sure that, they, that the populations don't grow, but don't kill these cats. That would be totally unjust. On the other hand, you know, then environmentalists will come back and say, well, you know, that'll work if you get all of them, which you never do. You know, not if you have hundreds of thousands, as we do here. And um, at any rate, even if you did get all of them, you know, it might take 15, 20 years before all of these cats die a natural death. So you don't actually solve the problem for another 20 years, by which time you might have no songbirds left. So it's, it's, they are actually good arguments on both sides, and I'm kind of interested in these where it's not obvious who's the, what's the good and what's the bad it's solution. It's a question of values. It's a question of values and collective decision making. So I think in New Zealand they've now made a, decision to say we're going to grandfather cats. So everybody who has cats can keep them. You're not supposed to let them out. We're not going to kill cats. But we're also not going to allow them to, to let them breed anymore. That might be a sensible way of thinking about it. Impossible to think that that would ever work here. But um, and, yeah, I don't know how well it works in practice in New Zealand. But it's interesting to think about those things and to think about sort of, you know, so what claim on our moral consideration do different species have in relation to each other? Because in, you know, whether we're conscious of it or not, we're doing this triage all the time in urban spaces. I mean, some, some things survive, others don't. And sometimes we do that intentionally, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like when we, uh, when we eliminate a mountain lion or a coyote in a neighborhood. But many times this happens indirectly, you know, where we put out rat poison and then it poisons the rats. We didn't intend so forth. Yeah. I mean, I think that's sort of where, sort of in this, under this uh, term of, of multi species justice, it's really interesting to think about, especially these hard cases where it's not yeah. so hard to. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's, it's interesting to try to think about the cases where there might be a solution um, that kind of erases the juxtaposition between what is, in quotes, good for humans and good for non humans. Um, I'll think about a second. So, for instance, I know in, in Counterforce we talk a lot about the history of environmental injustice in LA and urban planning and how that is something that both harms non-human organisms in the county um, and also harms humans in the county and there might be solutions that tackle both at once. So, for instance, the lack of parks in a lot of areas that are um, low income um, and predominantly occupied by people of color that have a history of systemic racism, that that is an environmental injustice issue that also affects habitat fragmentation. So it's sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's very challenging to deal with the juxtaposition between what humans want and what non-humans want or what different kinds of people want. But there are often, I think, in the urban landscape, there often are solutions that might exist if we delve into that conflict. That's true, um, and, and we, shouldn't un we shouldn't understate the number of cases where, you know, abating pollution is another, mm -hmm. I mean, abating water pollution, air pollution, that's a no-brainer. That's good for the non-humans and it's great for the humans. Um, and green space is the, mm -hmm. other, the other example um, that, that is really, um, you know, that, that is good for both. But the housing problem, of course, and green gentrification yeah. have made it a little more complicated Definitely. in recent years, you know, where some, um, some environmental justice advocates precisely who are also worried about making neighborhoods so green that then the original, that they become so desirable that um, the original residents are pushed out. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so uh, Jennifer Walsh up at UC Berkeley, she wrote this article, co-wrote this article a few years ago called Just Green Enough, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is sort of dealing with that issue of, you know, so what do you do as the creation of a new park then attracts more affluent residents that push out the poorer ones. Yeah. 
So, um, yeah, all kinds of really interesting questions, but I totally agree in many cases there are good solutions once we put our minds to it that could benefit various populations. Alrighty, on this note of uh, environmental justice and social justice, I'd like to thank you both very much. Um, and big round of applause, please, for thank you. Eleanor and Ursula. And we have a, a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, you can raise your hand and I'll come and find you with the mic. Hi, thank you both so much for a lovely talk. Um, I, have a, I have a lot of questions, but as a sort of Anthropocene-minded person, I was thinking a little bit about bird flu and the, the proximity, um, wanting to rethink architecture in a way that allows human habitats to be more hospitable to birds, which I think is wonderful, but um, also the, or just if that, how that is going at the moment in terms of um, juncos and yeah I can answer it in terms of juncos a little yeah. bit so currently at least in LA to our knowledge juncos do not have avian flu but it's something that we um, care about disease is very interesting in an urban context there is somebody in my lab who might be watching virtually that I will shout out to Wilmer Amaya Mejia he's a third year um, in the lab and he's specifically looking at parasites um, so it's very interesting because there's a lot that's unknown. So in one way, having these kinds of centers where a lot of birds come to, let's say bird feeders in an urban landscape, um, bird baths, so these central locations might be places where diseases can proliferate. And that feeds back into that question of, um, it can feed back into the, the environmental injustice question if we have only like a select places that birds come in certain locations, are they going to proliferate disease, um, especially if it's zoonotic? Um, so it's, it's interesting. On the other hand, there is evidence, at least in, I think, house sparrows, um, where an urban environment is, is actually a release from parasites that they, have, um, that they are more predisposed to outside of that environment. So it's, it doesn't get at the avian flu question directly, but the, the point is, yeah, it's, it's very unknown and there are probably dynamics that are unfolding in these new environments where the relationships between organisms has shifted. Um, so, yeah, so we don't really know. In terms of architecture or thinking about like being face to face with, uh, with a bird, I think that that goes back to, to the question of how do you befriend a bird in a reciprocal way and also acknowledging that that is another species that has its own life that is separate from me and, and thinking through all the negative ramifications. So I think that, I mean, I know that I come from a place of romanticizing wildlife. Um, there are people that obviously don't because of negative relationships. Um, so it's, it's trying to also kind of reprogram yourself of what am I romanticizing? What are the different um, potentialities of this kind of interaction or this kind of relationship that can increase that kind of um, direct contact that might be negative in, in that scenario, especially as zoonotic diseases are increasing with, with climate change in temperate regions. That's, it's important to consider. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> these, are, I mean, these are questions that come up all the time, sort of, I think, among bird watchers as well as pet bird keepers, because, I mean, if you have, like, an outdoor aviary or whatever, it's like, uh, recently everybody's been asking, oh, like, is it flu, you know? Should we keep our birds indoors? I mean, it's been a little bit cold anyway, so it's very rainy, so it hasn't been um, a big issue, but that's something you're concerned about if you have pet birds or chickens at home. Um, and also, a couple of years ago, there was a disease among finches going around, so everybody was like, should we dismantle our um, Niger seed feeders so that, for yeah. the reason that you mentioned, that feeders themselves can also become places where the disease gets transmitted. But I'll have to say, all of that seems to completely pale in comparison to the, to the poultry industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the main place where the problem lies. And in the last few, in a couple of months, something like, what, 60 million, or by now more, chickens have to, have, were, you know, un, exterminated in an untimely fashion before they were supposed to be killed um, because of these, um, you know, really horrendous conditions in which they are kept, you know, even the so-called free-range ones, which are mm -hmm. often just in these huge barns, but you see pictures of that, and there's like 30,000 chickens in like one barn. 
Um, so I think uh, that's a major, I mean, our, our animal agriculture is, is a major place of transmission of disease that, that I think makes everything else kind of pale in comparison. So I think that's where it has to start and where, you know, um, we have to think about our consumption habits and about the way in which we raise animals for food. Yeah, and just to, to piggyback off of that, because that's, to that's completely accurate and a lot of that transmission has to do with direct contact between human and non-human. So that's why you see things like swine flu and avian flu, specifically from those industries that have that interaction. Oh, yes, COVID. <laughs> Hi, thank you both so much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I also study birds. I know Ellie very well. We work together. Um, and I was wondering if you two could expand a little bit on um, the ethics of keeping a pet bird. I think birds can make wonderful pets, and, and clearly you're a very good caretaker for your, your pet birds. Um, but we also know that the illegal pet trade, the exotic pet trade, is a very big threat to birds, um, less so in North America, but certainly in other parts of the world. And, and where they are, are taken from their natural habitats, they can't end up here and be kept illegally. So I'm wondering if you could provide some sort of context on that issue and maybe some advice for those here who are inspired to maybe look into getting a pet bird, how you would do so um, ethically. And and then once it is in your home, how do you keep your birds engaged um, and give them what they would want to have in their natural habitat? Yeah, so um, I've had pet birds for almost 30 years, but I think actually nobody should keep birds. And that may sound contradictory, but I think that the, the violence that you do to birds is immeasurably larger than it is for cats or dogs who've had a chance to genetically and behaviorally adapt to human interaction for what, about 8,000, 10,000 years now, right? Beginnings of agriculture, whereas birds, most bird species, there's still absolutely nothing in their genes that prepares them to be in our bedrooms and our, in our living rooms. And um, the fact that they can get away so easily and that for birds who are not um, in their natural ecosystem and are not used to foraging for themselves, that means in the majority of cases, red crown parrots accepted and a few others, um, it means certain death. Um, so you have to keep them fairly confined, right? Um, so I actually, at, at the deepest level, I feel that it was a mistake ever to have, to have um, pet birds. Um, you know, I don't think they should be kept in captivity. I think it's just, um, it, yeah, it, it just violates everything that they naturally are in a much bigger way so, than some other domestic species. Also the fact that a lot of people keep extremely social species like parrots singly. Uh, and I mean, that would be another thing that I would say about uh, Jürgen's initial question, that befriending a bird then also implies a responsibility. I mean, you know, I'm now Charlie's flock, you know, our house is his flock. So, uh, you know, you want to think about, I mean, can you really have a single parrot, which he is not, he has other bird buddies, um, but, um, but that was part of the reason of getting other birds, because if you're going to be at work eight hours a day and your bird is all alone in a cage at home, that is really cruel. Um, so, because they're not used to that, and in their normal lives, they would never be alone. They would either be with a flock or, you know, in the breeding season, they would be with a mate and with chicks, you know, but they would never be on their own. And, and a lot of parrot species, at any rate, would not find it at all desirable. So, so at some level, I actually think, you know, um, the breeding of pet birds is totally irresponsible. Nobody should buy pet birds. So all of the birds that I have are adopted. Um, and Charlie adopted from somebody in Arizona about a year ago. Um, and there are a ton of, I mean, we have a real crisis, actually, of um, especially the larger parrots, which a lot of people buy because they think, oh, you don't have to walk a parrot. But um, actually, they're at least as possible quite a bit more demanding than a dog or a cat. And a cockatoo or an African gray will live 60, 70 years. So you have a, an animal with the intelligence of about a two or three year old child who will never go off to college. So, um, you know, we always try to present it to, like that to people who really want to buy them. And I've, I've told people who want to buy a cockatoo, just do not do it, you know. It's, invariably, it's because uh, the kids want it and the kids go off to college and then they have to find another 
uh, we have a real tsunami of, um, of parrots that people don't want anymore. Another common problem with, with parrots is because some of the larger species are very long-lived. They, um, their owners actually get old and have to go into nursing homes where they can't take pets. So they have to be um, rehomed, as we now say. So I think the only ethical way to keep pet birds is to adopt them. And they are really good. There's um, Fine Feathered Friends uh, Foundation here in LA. There's Mythical Companion Bird Rescue, which is outstanding up in the Bay Area. Um, and they all have tons of birds that need good homes. So I think that would be the ethical way to adopt them. And then, yeah, don't get a big bird if you have a small space. You know, get a small, a small space so that you can give them a nice cage, that you can allow them lots of um, out-of-cage time, because I mean, cages are also just kind of horrible when you think about it, you know? Um, and, um, and so, um, you yeah, know, and think about whether you can afford the vet care. I mean, vets, vets are super expensive, and um, that was sort of a shock to me when I got my first, my first pet bird, you know, it's just like how you drop hundreds of dollars at every visit. So these are all things to really think about. Um, even if you get a very small bird that costs like 15 bucks, like a budgie, you know, or a cockatiel that costs like, you know, 20 or 30 bucks. But it's actually a big responsibility. So, um, so I think that's where I think actually birds should not be kept by most people. And I'm, you know, just as a matter of principle, opposed to buying or selling animals. I mean, I just think they're not commodities. And they should not be traded as such. Is that bad? It's bad for the great cheese birds because they get sick, you know, some of the budgies that I adopted, um, you know, they just had up in these um, scaly mites, which deformed their, their sear and their, their feet, but a, a $10 shot of ivermectin will cure that, but a lot of people, if they bought the bird for $9.99, are not willing to go to a vet and get that shot, right? So it's really bad for the cheap birds, and it's also very bad for the very expensive birds, like the, like the macaws and the African grays, which cost thousands of dollars, and then you sort of a valuable commodity to resell, right? Um, so, so, yeah, so I just think animals, either as food or as pets, should not be commodities. And if you want to, if you want to keep them, as I do, and I love hanging out with them, they're really fun, and Charlie is like the greatest roommate ever, um, but um, you should adopt them. I mean, there's a lot of them out there that need, that need good homes, but never, ever buy them. I mean, that's just um, not a good idea. Yes, I think it supports that, that trade that, that you were mentioning, which yeah, which is that's horrible. Her horrible effects on wild populations is also horrible for the for the animals that are being traded. Yeah, it's very cruel industry after the capture and to the, yeah. the selling. I mean a lot of them yeah. died just in that process, right? I just smuggled birds like in the past and they died, right? It's just kind of sick. Yeah. Like they stuffed in in cardboard tubes. Especially don't don't buy ever buy any animals from anybody on Craigslist or something because you never you can, there's no way of knowing where they are from mm -hmm. and how they were captured. And there are some people sure. who sell red crowned parrots where I'm not sure oh, that wow. they're yeah. I mean if you go on the Los Angeles Craigslist um, and you know with a lot of those ads, my sense is that those are wild caught mm -hmm. red crowns um, and they're not going to make great pets. You know because they don't want to live in your house. They want to live in the eucalyptus, the, the, the non-native eucalyptus <laughs> trees of, of Pasadena. Um, and, um, you know, so, so that's still going on even here locally, that people can capture a red crown Amazon and then resell it for six or seven hundred dollars, right? People used to do that. And, and um, you know, some of the, when I look at the Craigslist ads, I have a sense that that's going on in some of these, you know, because it, it doesn't, I mean, when you ask uh, in pet, in reputable pet it will tell you that there is nobody who's legally breeding red crown parrots in Southern California. So where do these birds come from? The other thing to plug is that there are some feral pigeon rescues. So they're they're like pigeons that oh, yeah. are very social. They're very kind. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if there are any in LA. I know of one that was in New York. But when people bring in injured pigeons, if they can't be released, they make great pets because they they have more of a history with humans in there. Very cute. So that's an option. Also, only rescued. Charlie agrees. Charlie has a comment. <laughs> What's your comment? Hmm? 
Other questions? All right, so a big round of applause. Oh, we have an, an oh no, you were. Elizabeth. I'm curious about your research on campus. Can you tell us a bit sure. about the bird population that we're, yes. we're that we don't necessarily see, but we're living amongst? Yeah, I would love to. Always happy to talk about the juncos. So, um, the juncos, specifically uh, on campus, um, dark-eyed juncos are really cool birds. Uh, they have colonized a few different cities. They're native to to North America, including Southern California, but they're new in these cities as breeders. Um, and at UCLA specifically, you're going to see a banded bird population. And if anybody is interested in knowing who they're looking at, um, we have a map and we name all of the birds. So each have a unique combination of colors on their legs. Um, and we're looking at their morphology, their genetics, their behaviors, and how they are um, adapting to urban environments, how they might be different, but maybe not in a way that's adaptive, um, and how re repeated that is across cities. So the ones in LA, you're gonna, there are tons of breeding pairs, so if you just keep your eyes open, you'll see them, they've got little black heads. Um, and we see that they nest um, in novel places above ground very often in um, LA, and that seems like a repeated behavior between LA and San Diego, um, they morphologically diverge in the city, in Los Angeles specifically, in a way that other cities don't, which is really interesting and something we're trying to understand why. So their bill morphology is different here. Um, they are less afraid of humans. They are less aggressive. Um, we've had some like COVID studies um, as well, but they're, they're expanding in LA. It's, it's a really interesting, hopefully success story, but you never really know until the future happens if it's like a boom and crash. But so far they're doing really, really well, which is cool. And if you're interested in them more, feel free to email me and yeah, I can send you a map of all of our junkos. Yeah, I've seen the ones with the little bands. I was that's, wondering yeah, about that's that. us. That's, uh, yeah. I think they have pink or orange bands. Yeah, we have, yeah, they're like, I think we have 10 different colors. So each, each has a unique combination of colors. Oh, yeah. They have creative names. It's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, this is a Junko. I forgot who this is. I'm sorry. But yeah, you can see. Oh, wow, so they, they have a bunch of rings. Yes, they all have three colored bands. Some of them are split bands, so two colored single bands. And then they each have a um, unique metal band that has a number only attached to that one bird across all of North America for that size of a band. Um, so yeah, so they, they are all uniquely identifiable, which is cool. And that's the, the white and black contrast that I was telling you about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so they vary in that. Urban birds seem to have less white in their tails than non-urban birds, which is very interesting and something uh, we're trying to understand. So they, yeah, they might be associated with aggression. They also breed more in the city than non-urban places, so they have double the uh, breeding season, which is very interesting, double the nest. So do you use eBird and iNaturalist as sources of data for your research? Um, I use it at more exploratory than anything. Um, Olivia uses eBird a lot um, for, for her research. But yeah, so we use it to see where they are. Um, so we've expanded to looking across Los Angeles at the Junko population rather than just at UCLA. And as mentioned, they've been expanding, so they're in newer areas. And we use that more as like, where should we go to catch a bird? Uh, where can we reliably find a junco? So that we use it for um, somebody, uh, Wilmer in my lab and I, we've been exploring questions that we hope to use eBird for, which is around um, what I was mentioning, um, systemic racism on the landscape and redlining and how that might relate to populations, um, which eBird has been used for uh, recently across the US. Um, so looking at, at that kind of like landscape level effect on, um, on bird communities. Yeah, I was really amazed a while ago, uh, Greg Pauly, who's a herpetologist at the Natural History Museum, he studied an amazing study with some collaborators um, oh, here. that um, <laughs> on lizards, where um, I think they were um, southern alligator lizards, which are, you know, uh, pretty, pretty common around here, and so they, since on iNaturalist you have pictures of all of them, not only did they study where the lizards showed up, but um, they studied the mites on the faces of the lizards, and um, studied, and I forget now what the, what the conclusion was, whether they have more mites closer to downtown or more mites out in the wild. I think there was more mites out in the wild. But I was absolutely amazed that you could study something like that. Um, and um, 
and it seems like an amazing resource for yeah. this, this kind of thing. You no, know, it's you, really cool, but it's a picture for every yeah. observation. And then, however biased it might be, and I asked him about that, you know, he says, yes, but the number of observations, the number of data you have is still so much bigger than any traditional thing that still yeah. is. You have to really think about the question that you're asking for yeah. that. So that's, yeah, that's when those biases come to play. So um, are you looking at something that doesn't exist there, or do you just have missing data? I think that's that's the biggest thing that happens, especially with iNaturalist. But yeah, you can yeah. definitely look at, it's also very great they've done studies um, using iNaturalist data of um, organisms that seem, in quotes, like out of range. So you can see what, you can update certain kinds of maps also with those, um, with those data sources, which is really cool. There's a lab, um, to plug Olivia's lab, Morgan Tingley's lab uses a lot of eBird data specifically oh, to really? look at okay. um, population yeah. dynamics. Cool. Your bird are monopolies, you can do all that you want. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you submit it, it's an obligation. Yeah, no, it's really cool. I mean, Greg Pauly actually said that, you know, whatever you submit to eBird or iNaturalist, you can actually consider as part of your legacy, because that will be mm -hmm. a long time archives and so that that was really encouragement because with eBird one of the problems is that you only ever tempted to post normally if you see something rare or you see a lot of a particular species. But that for me was really sort of like saying, say oh, that's okay, every, every time I go out I'll just count whatever is out there and post it because it's the you undercount the common birds, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the time. So that was a real incentive to yeah, go out and awesome. pay attention to the geckos and the micro Thank you so much once again, Ellie and Ursula. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. Thank you.